good. So we got um we got Robert Dean on the pedicab. We got we got this like artistic jack of all trades. Howdy. Uh coming at you. Um what have you done so far? You've done a lot. Like you you've written in the Statesman, you almost had an article published in Vice, you're really big in the comedy scene in Austin. Um you got a TV show that you're putting out. Like what what are you doing right now and what have you done? Uh, I've written for the Statesman, I've written for Mike, Fatherly, uh, Forbes, what else, USA Today, I've got two books published, two more coming out this year. What are the year. books you got? There was one called In the Arms of Nightmares that's out of print, there's another one called The Red Seven that's available on Amazon, that's a, like a super dark Tarantino style western. Okay. And then I have a book coming out, Snakes in the Garden, which is a poetry collection in August? September, I think September it comes out. All right. And then um, my big essay collection, which I fucking threw my guts in, is called Existential Thirst Trap. That comes out uh, this winter. What's that about? It's a collection of essays touching on everything. I used to live in New Orleans before I lived here. <clears throat> and so it's a bunch of like New Orleans drinking stories of wild shit, like fucking pulling all nighters and kept walking out of the bar at nine o'clock in the morning. But then I also. I, t- I tell a bunch of wild ass stories, but then I talk about like I have high, I'm high functioning anxiety and depression. I I put that shit on Front Street. I put that I'm a practicing Buddhist. I put well, I talk about my faith with that. Or I wouldn't say my faith, but my like moral compass with Buddhism is in there. I talk about my divorce. Um, I talk about like my heroes and their deaths, how they affect. Like when Anthony Bourdain died, it was the first time in my life that like like when I was a kid, I was really affected by the death of Kurt Cobain. Because he was my favorite singer. When he died, he How was... How old my... were you when he died? Because I was like six. Oh, I was 13. Okay. So, like, Nirvana was my favorite band. So, like, that was the first time I had a real tangible death. That, like, somebody that I looked up to and wanted to be, ultimately, had died. And so, how, do, how did that affect me? And then, now as a man, when Bourdain died, that, like, legitimately fucked me up. Because he was, like... he had all, Him and Henry Rollins had always been the two guys that I'd always wanted to be. It's like, do you like those dudes knew a lot about a lot of things. They were they traveled. They were smart. They were punk rockers like I am. And so they were always my compass of like one day, maybe if you get your shit together, you You could be like that. that. Yeah. And Anthony Bourdain has a lot of mental stuff that he was going through that he overcame. Ultimately, he didn't, though. Yeah. But do you believe that narrative that he committed suicide? Yes. Yeah, what else would there be? I mean, I don't know. There was stuff going on about how like he was like starting to like expose a lot of child trafficking and that's like just saying all that shit. That's stupid. You think that's just silly? That's just but fucking... I, I remember hearing stuff like that. I didn't like go down that rabbit hole, but I remember they were saying no, a lot man. of shit about how he was like. That's just fucking stupid. Because if you know anything about Anthony Bourdain, if you've ever read any of his material, if you've ever seen his TV show, he was open about his mental health struggles. You read any one of his books, the, the line of I'll hang myself in the shower which was ultimately how he killed himself, he had said it like 10 times. He had talked about his demons openly. It's just the thing about what depression is that people don't realize is we make these jokes. The first time you put that belt around your neck and ultimately want to do it, that wasn't the first time that you did it, the one, the time that killed you. So if when somebody has these things, there's a clear trail of breadcrumbs. Okay. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I, do you think that there's like a push in the media though, like, or on, like with these tech companies to like, get more and more people to have these issues mental health issues yeah i think social media is bad for people ultimately i know it's a it's an necessitive part of our culture that we need like in the set it's not that we don't need it but it connects people it's strangers become friends some of the greatest fucking friends i have i met online yeah and like it i understand wholeheartedly what it does but at the same time the idea of an influencer is fucked up it's the idea that you're not watching this person for tangible content and says, hey, man, look, I'm doing this cool shit. Here's why I'm doing it. Here's why it's important. Here's why you can join me on this journey. No, it's somebody laying by a fucking pool and you're giving these kids, anybody that like wants to whatever thing that they aspire to want to be. They want that life and they don't see all the other shit on the other side. Yeah. And then they hold themselves to and then they hold themselves to a standard of, of like beauty or like of like. Yeah. Yeah, or that's like, the standard of success, or they, or everybody, or because of like one or two influencers now, everybody wants to be an influencer instead of like earning something of stature. It's like yeah, doing something like that's actually worthwhile, and then people feel ang- anxious and depressed because they judge their worth based on what other people think of them and like, all this stuff, right? When so. you your entire 
persona. Like we, I'd hung met this dude who works with a bunch of influencers. He was telling me all this behind the scenes shit of like how they're all broke and they don't understand money, but they have to keep up the appearance. And he's like, a lot of them are fucking super fucked up. And because the idea of keeping up with the Joneses, the, the parameters you set upon yourself to try to achieve this thing that ultimately just doesn't even exist. Like it's, it's the idea of this, um, what's the best way to put it? It's the idea of there is this worth and this value to something, but really what is that? Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's silly. Yeah. But I also think too, just, um, going back to like what, what, what they put in your food, what they put in your water, you know, the, the medications that they prescribe to people, the way they do the vac, even the way they could be doing vaccinations, right? Like, um, everything, it's all designed to get people sick so that you continually depend on these pharma companies. Like there's a lot of reach and a lot of lobbying and a lot of influence that like these big pharma companies have in our society. And yeah, it's I mean, we're the terrifying. Only, it's terrifying. We're the only country in the world that allows for pharmaceuticals to advertise directly to the people. Like if it, the way media is structured at this point, if pharmaceutical companies didn't have the media pool that they do, ultimately fucking half the media would collapse because they pay so much and that's why they keep them in because like if you go to Australia, I've been to Australia, they they think it's fucking wild that you can um, that you can advertise to somebody like, yeah, you got this problem with you? It's like, no, dude, that's just fucking medicine. How are you advertising a medicine to somebody? But they have gamified the system so much that how do you take how do you take this person's health and you fucking turn it into a commodity? Our entire medical structure is fucked up here. No, no, I, I agree with you. And I, there's also like this thing too, where like, it's almost becoming like, I hate saying it, but it's almost becoming, this is like lack of a better word, but it's almost like becoming like trendy and cool to like have mental problems almost with how it's like, I mean, I don't think it is, but I think <laughs> like they're trying to put it out there like that. Right. Like, I mean, I, but I also agree for advocacy though, because as somebody who struggles with those things, I think it's really important to be open about it and to I, talk about I it. I agree. I, look, I have a bunch of learn. I struggled with a bunch of learning disabilities when I was in school, and I, like I, I went to like a, you know, like I had, had like specialized classes. Like I took a little bus when I was younger and stuff like that. Like I understand all of that stuff, but I also think that there that society is like weaponizing that, and society and like our mainstream society wants more and more people to feel that way because the more people that feel powerless and hopeless and helpless, well, the less they get to revolt against a tyrannical system. Effectively, I don't know. I that that, that means stretch. Just, I mean, but that, that's really what I think, though, right? So I think that there's, like, what you're saying has validity, but I also think that, like, mental health is being weaponized and mental illnesses are being weaponized. I think it's – I don't see it that way. I mean, realistically, when you um, you struggle with mental health, we are at a place now, like, weaponizing the idea of we, – we don't have honest conversations about it. Because a lot of people are scared to talk about it. Men are bred to be like, yeah, don't be tough, pussy. No, I don't, think, I don't think that's the case anymore, though. I think people, I think we're getting a lot better about that. We are now because we've had fucking school shootings and all kinds of other shit. Like, yeah, that dude was fucked up and you guys didn't do anything about it. Yeah. And, like, I should never be allowed to own guns. Ever. Really? Like, no. You don't think that you should be allowed to own a gun? No. I'm fucking crazy, man. I have depression. Really bad depression. When you have really bad depression, like my ex-wife... I went through a huge depressive episode and she, I would, I fought a full blown fucking meltdown a couple of years ago. I had lost my job. When you're a writer, you lose jobs, you get them, you lose them. It's part of the gig. I know that now, but I'd lost a really good job. And then I had lost the opportunity to make fucking serious money. And then they told me it was because I would get bored because I was too well-rounded of a writer. And they're like, Oh, what would you would have you doing? You, I was like, I got a fucking two kids, man. I'll write the fucking phone book if you pay me enough. Right, yeah. I don't give a shit, but I had a full-blown breakdown, and I was super, super depressed. And my ex-wife saw how unhinged I was, and we used to, we had a gun for protective purposes that we kept in my office. And she was like, I am never going to keep this around you ever again. You will never know where this gun is in this house. Not for the sake of me harm harming them. It's harming myself. Okay, and that, so, okay. Okay, I, I understand that from that perspective. And so it's like, well, like I'm going to shoot guns. We're shooting for the TV stuff where I'm going to shoot guns, and it's ultimately going to make me feel very uncomfortable. But I'm going to do it because it's something that I need to do with the guests, but also it's for me to make myself more comfortable around the idea of this thing that I have a really rocky relationship with. But, but are you feeling better now? Like, it seems like you're pretty on point with things now, right? Uh, it comes and goes. I was depressed yesterday morning. It just it comes and goes. You can't. 
you know, like working out, you won't look at it. I mean, my fat, fu I'm sweating like a fucking pig right now, but I try to get out there and like run or jog or do uh, walking meditations and stuff, but I'm, that helps. Yeah, I mean, appearances are also very deceptive when it comes to fitness. Like, you look at somebody like Roy Nelson, right? And he's just this, looks like this fat blob who eats Burger King for breakfast, right? But he's one of the best athletes in the world. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Or, or like Daniel Cormier looks like Carl from um, Family Matters. Do you know? Like Carl Winslow. So it's like, but that th these are world-class athletes. So, I mean, appearances are definitely deceptive when it comes to physical fitness. And I think people need to do a better job of understanding that, you know, especially since we're a society that's preaching tolerance and whatnot, you know. Um, but I also think that, like, yeah, what you put into your body and what you do with your time and, like, your financial security and, like, the relationships that you cultivate – are definitely a really good medication for treating mental illness, and they could almost be better than some of these pharma substances. I don't, I mean, I was prescribed. I don't take anything for my anxiety or depression outside of CBD. Okay, CBD is great. Yeah. CBD works for me. And microdosing is really good too. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to do the full blown mushroom thing. I'm going to trip real hard because they say it like erases a year of depression, which I, I'm going to do it because I would give anything to not be depressed for a fucking year. That'd be insane. And. Um, when I, I, they gave me these meds for my anxiety, it made me a zombie and I, I'm a really bad flyer. And so when I fly, I just get fucking shit faced and that's just how I do it. But that time that I flew, I was flying with my ex-wife and my kids to Disney world. Okay. And so I couldn't do that. So they gave me my, my ex was like, just take one of your pills. You know, it's going to make you a zombie, but you'll get through the flight. And so I got through the flight. I got we were hanging out and I was the residual effects from it. I was sitting in Disney World, literally at Disney World, falling asleep at a table my first day there. You should be hyped as fuck to be to there. To be in Disney World, yeah, yeah. And when, if you're falling asleep, something's wrong. And that day, I was like, I'm never taking these again. And so I don't take them, like, meditating, getting exercise, sleeping, and CBD is how I manage mental health problems. I think CBD is great. Like, um, I buy my girlfriend, like, do soul all the time, you know what I mean? Because she has, yeah. like, anxiety about a lot of shit, too, you know? I go to, just there's a shop up north called Green Mountain Flower Company, and I stand by them. The dude, Gene, that runs it is a fucking guru, and he's always taking care of me. I think they should also allow co Like, I had um, a couple, like, ex-cops on my show, and I think that they should allow police officers to smoke weed. Not, like, on the job, but, like, they shouldn't be drug testing cops for weed yeah, because dude. of the stress and the anxiety that comes with that Cop type of job, you know? Cops have PTSD within, like, the first six months of the fucking gig. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, like, one of the hardest jobs in America to do. And, granted, there's some really bad cops that don't do, them any, ser that don't do any services and there should be accountability. But, that being said, um, you have so much stress and anxiety and it's your worst, you know, you're dealing with people on their worst days usually. Yeah. Like, like for, for you to not allow a cop to smoke weed on, on their downtime is criminal i think the we you know what i mean like that's no i agree with yeah. i totally agree with you we have a fundamental problem with policing in this country in the sense that you're taking somebody you're giving them six weeks of training and then throwing them out there and be like yeah you got to deal with all this like cops should know how to do fucking jujitsu and Facts, shit. Dude, that's what i'm saying I, I ran a city council campaign and said that i'm like you should have at least a blue belt in jujitsu in order to be a police officer you should also have an emt basic certification yeah, and that means you know the defund. That means you can't defund the departments, but it just also means that you got to do a better job of allocating the funding that you get towards that, right? Like, you, I think the defunding the police, the is the worst marketing of all time because I, ultimately, <laughs> when you talk to someone about real solutions with police, when you have a conversation of being like, should a cop have to take to do this thing? Is a cop somebody who is a social worker? They're like, no. What do cops do? They take care of criminals. Somebody who's like had too much to drink is not a criminal. Somebody who's just like loud and boisterous on a the street. There should be ways that we carve up how we're spending our money and what we're doing. Like cops don't need fucking tanks. You do not need a fucking tank and like all these crazy military gear. No, you, you should don't. take that you money you and invest it again in like your EMT stuff, your jujitsu shit. That's like how you create a more well-rounded or even in hiring more cops. Yeah, you can I mean, even invest that money that you spend on tanks and all this high-tech weaponry to just hire more police officers. Yeah, hire more, but, like, make them more well-rounded. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, versus yeah. tactical gear and all this other shit. It's like, because I was there when all the protests were happening in Austin. I was at all of them. I was fucking, I got my pictures on my phone, videos. I wrote about it. Charlie got pepper sprayed. And tear, do you get tear gas or pepper sprayed, Charlie? Damn, so yeah, Charlie got fucked up from these, just covering him. Yeah, I was there covering him too, and I watched all that shit go down, man. That first night, whew. 
But you also had a se- that first night was crazy. But you also had like a serious understaffing problem with the police too, because you saw how many people that were you saw like you know cars getting lit on fire. You saw like a couple small businesses getting broken into. And there was no there was no way that these guys could have stopped any of this shit from no. happening. Um, so you're like, oh, you want to defund the police, but also like look how understaffed they are when something like that happens. So you got to figure out how to like work around that, that and find that middle ground, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird thing because generally growing up in Chicago, we have a very contentious relationship with cops. Yeah, duh. And here and in New Orleans was different. New Orleans cops don't give a fuck about anything. I think Austin cops are pretty cool about that, that too. Like they don't give a shit. They're Austin, like the super troopers in, in many ways. Austin cops generally, generally, I mean, have Austin cops fucked up? Yes, they have yeah. because Mike Ramos and all that shit. But ultimately. Austin cops, by and large, my interactions with them over my years of living in this city, they're usually pretty cool. Like, they're, we, we don't live in this, like, hellscape of a place where they're, like, constantly trying to fucking look over their shoulder. Ultimately, any interactions I have, but I'm also a white dude. So I don't know what it's like to be a black guy in this town. So Maybe. I mean, I, 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 I see that perspective, right? I'm saying as somebody who drives a pedicab, yeah. right, I, my interactions with APD are fucking awesome. Like, they are really cool with us. They are great, right? And so because of my personal experience and how it relates to my job, I got no problems with APD. I think, I think that there are some things they should fix and work on, but they should also fix and work on them because what we have, like, the, uh, my opinion is, like, how APD operates and how they treat me, it's really good. I want it to continue happening. And I don't want, like, that, the, I don't want that department to get disbanded and replaced by something that could not treat me as well, right? So, like, that's my perspective on it. Yeah. Um, and so I also pedicabbed um, the Kentucky Derby in 2017. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this, man. The cops in Louisville were fucking assholes. I bet. Like, they did not, they, they were, like, telling us that we couldn't operate on the streets or that we couldn't go on the sidewalks. Or they were, like, one cop told us that we could do something and another cop told us that we had to do something else. So it, it, it really, like varies depending on where you are in terms of what your relationship with law enforcement is going to be but in terms of austin like i think the austin cops are actually like really cool and like i'm t- i talk like i bring up the jujitsu training stuff and i bring up like the fact that like we shouldn't be testing for weed on a drug test for police officers i had a 30-year vet from the force talk to me about that and he was like kind of receptive to what i was saying right and like that's good that the fact that they're receptive to that means like maybe like there's hope and our, our police department in austin is not they're not the people that you got to be fighting against so much, right? Like maybe you got to fight with, maybe you got to like enact change and reform in a different way in Austin versus in Louisville, Kentucky or New York city. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, you, like that, that's my, my take on it, right? No, like, I, I don't disagree with the premise at all. I just think that we just need to hold accountable. Poli- we need accountable policing. You just don't get to fucking kill who you want to kill. And if we're going to set the standard of making a more well-rounded verdant, society in terms of how we're like policing and doing those things set the fucking example man be the place that you're like no see this is what cops should look like this is what we should invest in let's let's set the standard for what community minded policing looks like in michigan they just proposed legislation mandating that every cop has to have a blue belt in order to be a police officer that's probably a good thing fucking great yeah that's what they gotta do i think jujitsu is one of those things i did it i was telling you off camera is i did it one time and I had, I had fun doing it, but it fucked my knee up, and I was walking with a knee brace for, like, two weeks. Aye. And it legitimately, it's still, I got a little junk in there. I don't know what I did, but I need a little time to heal, so I ain't hopping back in the in the gym anytime just yet. Yeah, yeah I gotcha, yeah. Uh, but it humbles you, and I think that it kind of, like, it's almost, as somebody who meditates, it's close to meditation because at in that moment, you're making choices for a reason, but it also gets a lot of, like, things out of you. That I think maybe we're buried in there. Like I looked at it as this really like people. One of the guys he was like, "Yeah, did you get all your anger out?" I was like, "No, dude. I do, I wasn't thinking angry thoughts whatsoever. I was thinking of like, how do I make this strategic move because this fucking gigantic dude has this fucking knee in my neck. Like, yeah, like the idea of my movements having practice and having them have purpose. I think." would help alleviate a lot of things that some people are dealing with because it's a place to be mindful. And, and it translates to life, too, yeah. because it makes you into a problem solver. And so, like, when you're looking at problems that are facing society or facing your life in general, like, you start thinking three moves ahead. And you start thinking, like, all right, well, how do I solve this problem that's in front of me, right? Or how do I at least take the step to improve the problem so it's not as big of a problem, right? And like, Then there's also the exposure to diversity, right? So it's like... Look, man, you're, you're you go to 10th Planet Austin, and you got everybody of every different color and sexual orientation and gender like coming out and training, right? Like, how are you going to be racist when you're exposed to everybody? Yeah, you can't. Like, it's impossible. 
you're you're learning you learn about people and you learn about people you've never interacted with. but this is the one common truth that you guys believe in is this activity i think that's true for all things but ultimately for in the context of a police officer i think that would be something that is mutually and it, beneficial and it's a really good way to interact with the community because you start to see people on better days and you get to be in a situation where people like you right because if you're a cop right and you're at the and you're like at the gym right and you're rolling and you're grappling everybody's gonna want to help you everyone's gonna be like oh shit this is a cop like let's like i'm some brown like you're some brown belt or some black belt like yo i want to help this guy like let me give this guy attention let me like be really positive and nurturing to this officer because i'm helping him become better at his job yeah or her job right like so i think that like it gives a better glimpse uh, it makes it gives you a more like a, a more positive like glimpse into the world around you or society and it helps with the process of being jaded, I think. Like, even as a pedicabber, man, like, you can get really jaded being a pedicab driver working in the service industry and, like, doing jujitsu and training and, like, it gives you, like, a taste of normal life in a different perspective. So you become, like, not only less jaded, but you start to enjoy interacting with the people that you pedicab around downtown. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's so important. Like, it's such an important thing to do to, like, do activities like that outside of your job. When you do the pedicab stuff, do you have do you keep the speakers on and all that? And with oh the yeah, music? I play music. Dude, I make rap songs about conspiracy theories. I'm always dropping these knowledge bombs, Robert. Come on, <laughs> come on, man. That's funny. Hey, they thought they were getting a ride, instead they're getting an education. It's like you came for the ride, but you stayed for the woke knowledge bombs. <laughs> um. So, you do. You're speaking of um. All that stuff, though. You're pretty big in the comedy scene. So yeah. what, what exactly? You're doing stuff with Laugh Factory. No, so Big Laugh Comedy. Big Laugh, okay, Big Laugh Comedy, okay. Big Laugh Comedy, I'm ed editor-in-chief, so the content that we, well, we have a new website dropping. We're the ones that book much of the big shows that happen here in Austin. You booked Rogan. Yeah, I was at a show last night. That I wanted to go, but um, I, I just didn't go. I had so many I had car was, problems, and I was at the gym, and I just had yeah, to, that, you know, I just. That show, had I, had I not be in the position that I'm in, I would have never gotten into that fucking show. Every single A-list person in Austin was trying to get into that shit last night. That's funny. Like, you they, know that I've, I've opened for Eddie Bravo and Sam Tripoli with Tinfoil Hat with my rap songs? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've never met those dudes. I've never met Rogan, actually. I've met everybody else. Um, but, yeah, I'm the one that creates... I'm in charge of the content that we're doing. So, like, the writing and we're about to do a bunch of videos and all that shit. That path comes through me. Brandon is the brains behind the company. He is the man that fucking makes the ships move, and he's a fucking genius with that shit. I'm like the weird uncle who's like, we should do this, and can I have money to do that? And he's like, you can have money to do that. <laughs> uh, that's dope. Okay, cool. So, I'm, um, you know, he's the business mind 100%, and he's fucking really good at it. That's that's tight. I um, I, I have to go out and see, see him one day. Or at the very least, I got to just go pedicab a night that he's performing and just hang out at Side Vulcan or do whatever, you know? Oh, Rogan? Yeah. He's there tonight. I can't. I'm, I'm going uh, hunting tonight, actually. Oh. My boss's bachelor party. So I get to hunt a hog for the first time in my life. Speaking of shooting guns, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about it. That's some wild Especially shit. Especially with, like, the, the cyber attack and all the meat that's happening. Like, you need to get that good meat right now. Can't be eating that processed food. We were talking about all, this, all these mental issues. So, you know. Yeah, I try to, you know, keep a... I try to keep a diet that is, is you know, is organic and... Listen, I, I try Robert, to, I, if I kill a hog... I will share some of it with you. I'd eat it. I, I, I got I'm, you, bro. Like, I will share some of the hog that I kill with you if I kill a hog. I'm super, super, On camera. super into food. All right. So, like, I'm obsessed with cooking and food and I, food I've knowledge. been, like, going out and, like, catching my own fish, like, every couple weeks just, like, for mental decompression and stuff like that. Yeah. If you ever want to go fishing. My old me. man is a fucking fisherman, and he would he was here, and he brought his own pole, all this shit, and every time I go out there, I need to, when I'm home, I'm going to go home for July. Okay. I'm, I'm from Chicago, and I'm going to go up there for the whole month, and I'm going to try to, like, go fishing with my dad. That's a meditative experience, too. Like, that is yeah. such a fun thing to do to, like, really calm you down, you know? I'm going to make it a point to go fishing with him, because ultimately, it's never been my deal, but I be, to spend time with him, because he's getting older, I want to go do go it. Go microdose and go fishing, and see how you feel, yeah, like, for the next, like, month or so. The old man would be like, yeah, you want to do some shrooms? That's he's, what's up. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, he's that, that's into, cool. He's into that shit. Bob um, parties. That's that's awesome. Um, I had Marty Clark on like a while ago. Okay. That was fun. But I was just talk, trying to talking about Bill Gates and whatnot, and he didn't know, didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. So that was uh, <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I don't really. Know, I know. I know. I know of that dude, but I don't know him. He was really cool. He was like a fun person to talk to. 
right? But then I started dropping these knowledge bombs on Bill Gates and depopulation. And he was just got that shit was just flying over his head, and he was just like, "What the fuck did I sign up for?" <laughs> it's like, this is a fucking weird ass petty cab this dude. This motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, it's a good good time. Um, so you're doing the the big the big laugh comedy, right? Yeah. Okay, and then you had some articles in Vice. Did you get did did, did it get published or what, uh, no? What so happened? my stuff okay. with Vice it got killed because the editor I was uh, friendly with he lost his gig once like they had to start cutting budgets like when you write for people essentially right now most publications have a very small crew and then that's all freelancers just pitching pieces so, so i pitched a piece okay and then it got killed what was the piece about I, to be honest with you i you don't, don't remember, even remember. All right. i write so much shit all the time that i don't even remember and you wrote for the statesman right yeah so what did you write about like do you, could you do you have any highlights of what you wrote about that got in the statesman I wrote about kneeling when that was a thing, about when people were like, you shouldn't be able to kneel. And I was like, yeah, you should. Who gives a shit? Uh, I wrote about kneeling. I wrote about Hurricane Harvey. That article went viral, actually. Well, okay. Um, you got to send it to me when, when you finish. I want to read it. Yeah, I'll find it. It was an op-ed piece that I wrote about, like, the resiliency of Texas. Okay. And because this is place, I mean, how long, are you from here? No, but I'm from New York, man. And I, but I've been here for about eight years since like okay. 2013, since like August, August like 12th, 2013 was my, uh, it's going to be, I believe my eight year anniversary. Okay. So one thing that when you're an outsider, I think is interesting about Texas is when Texas needs Texas, these motherfuckers stick together. Like when Hurricane Harvey happened or like anything else. Even the grid, we all, everybody stuck together. Yeah. That's the- what I'm saying is there's this resiliency about this place that like, I just don't see had certain things happen in like like when sandy hit new york and in that area i was there when it happened i was yeah. Th- it, th- that level of people taking care of each other and caring is impressive but it's not like this place where this whole fucking gigantic state with 36 million people people from lubbock were sending shit to houston like it's these wild huge metro areas that like they fall under the one banner of texas and it's really impressive how like they stand together through all this shit and I appreciate that about the people who are from here. That is actually a really cool thing. Um, I was actually in Florida when that went down. So Yeah, I, I was still in New Orleans when Sandy went down. No, no, I'm talking about when the winter storm happened. I was in Florida. Oh, shit. You all right? No, some, I uh, didn't know there was a father. I, hold on. Uh, somebody, there was a call. What? Oh, boy. Can, I, can we pause for like one second? Yeah, we'll pause. All right. So, uh, shit, you just, you, you, you just got off the phone with a, you just had a pretty important phone call, right? Yeah, I had to deal with, I had a quick family thing right quick, and I have to, have to deal with, I have to put a fire out later. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, we're not, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I guess the one last thing we're going to talk about, too, is um, you've gotten articles published in the Statesman and whatnot, right? And there's a whole thing going on in Aust- um, regarding the Statesman about Gannett Media, the parent company, not letting them unionize, like not letting them unionize. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, one of the things that I talked about, or one of the one of the I think great leverage point of the writers should be that well, if you don't let us unionize, if you don't give us the benefits that we deserve, um, writing for a mainstream publication, which is probably one of the, like the hardest, most taxing, most thankful, most underpaid jobs in the country. Um, well, if, if you don't start treating us like how we deserve to be treated, well, guess what? We're going to start, you know, writing investigative pieces exposing the board members of our parent company. Yeah. Because you know, like, there's probably at least one of those guys was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe. I mean, I mean you know, like, I, I would I would start investigating that shit like a motherfucker. If I were a statesman reporter and I wasn't getting benefits and I wasn't getting treated the way I should be getting treated, I'm like, oh, interesting. It, I'm gonna, dude, like, I'm going to do some serious digging into who the people are. Uh, who, 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 who our parent company is. Dude, the Statesman has changed hands a few times over the years. And it's like, I didn't even know who had bought. Like, I know they, like, when I started doing stuff, with Sinclair owned them. And then it changed again. And then, I guess, where they kind of are now is I support them doing all that shit. Be able to unionize. Because they get fucked, man. They had this, like, gigantic, big, robust operation. And they just keep squeezing them down and down and down. It's like, well, they need something left. Yeah, and, and you know, I think also the best way to rebel for these people is to start actually doing real journalism. Don't just write what your parent company tells you to write. Like, write what, write, write what's out there. You know. Yeah. You know, when, when you start covering local elections, cover those local elections honestly. I agree. That's that's it. Cover them honestly. Like, if you like a candidate but they're not getting that mainstream support, 
write that you like a candidate. Like I had Ryan Attila on my podcast, and, I, and that guy's really cool. He's actually one of the better journalists, right? But when he wrote about the city council race, um, I, I was the only person that was talking about how grappling training should be mandatory for the cops. And he didn't write, like when he talked about the race, he didn't mention that, even though he told me via text, like, I really think that's a good idea. As a former wrestler, I think that's a really good idea, and it should Some, be implemented. It, sometimes it just the uh, the idea doesn't fit the scope of the piece, and just sometimes it just doesn't work that way. Like, if you're kind of have one long narrative and you're trying to have a point of view, sometimes there's auxiliary stuff that you generally are like, yeah, well, that doesn't really work for this. So, it's just you kind of put it in your back pocket of maybe that could work in a different piece that I'm going to write down the line. Sure. No, and I understand that, but I think for for like a local race that's an important policy thing when you're a local candidate and you're dealing with a sweeping policy issue like policing especially based on how things were last year i think that should have been important but point being is i'm not trying to like criticize them or anything i'm just saying that if you know you're feeling that if a staff member on a newspaper is feeling that mistreated by the parent company start writing like start writing about the stuff in more detail right like that's all yeah that makes sense it's it's all perspective on what the piece is and what the editor wants there's a lot of pieces that go involved in when you're working on something as a writer so it's not ultimately what's uh what's important is you have to get the, the meat of the story out and if you don't do that if you don't tell the ultimate truth of the story that's when you kind of like go yeah. down weird but paths. i don't really trust the media to tell the ultimate truth of anything after covid i think i think covid has really fucked up the impression of mainstream media and the perception that they have you know i don't know i mean just the lab leak theory just the whole the whole lab leak theory alone is undermining so much trust that people have in mainstream media. I'm not saying that I agree with it or disagree. I'm just saying, like, for, in terms of how people think. I just think that with COVID, with everything else, was a whole lot of people trying to figure out a whole fucking clusterfuck. I think it's Occam's Razor, and it says that, and that idea that the the most obvious truth sometimes is the truth, and there isn't like this Gordian knot of all these conspiracies. It's just the whole world was just trying to figure out what the fuck was happening. When they're like, should we sanitize the desk? Do you have to wear gloves? What is this? Cause they didn't know. So it's a whole lot of problems. It's like the ventilators thing. They figured out that ventilators were killing people. Like my ex-wife is one of the best nurses in Texas. She's got all these fucking awards and they, it's just, they were learning as they were going. I think with the media, with, you know, with, with a lot of people, with the way that they write is, you don't want to put shit out there that you don't necessarily, you can't track, you can't figure out the lineage of that piece. No, but they were saying that there's no way that the COVID came from a lab. They were saying that that, like, that has been disproven like numerous on numerous occasions, and now the lab leak theory is back. Like, I just, that, that's what I remember. And like, have you looked at the FOIA emails from Fauci? No. Did so we... a bunch of FOIA emails came out about like what Dr. Fauci's communication with his own staff members regarding COVID and masks and like generic treatments and whatnot. You should re read those emails, man. It's, it's some, it's really eye opening stuff. Yeah. I'll have to look. I mean, I'm this is about journalism. This is about getting the truth out. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think you should read those emails and, and like, I'd want to hear your perspective based on what those email, what's in those emails and what you think about how the media was covering things or if they knew about it or whatever it is, man. Like, I think it's an important thing to read, you know? Yeah. I'm it's right now. It's like, there's so much information all the time. So it's like, it, you get it and you kind of have to process it, figure it out, and then find what your ultimate truth is. But it does feel like there was an agenda. Like this entire year, it just felt like the media had an agenda. You know, like it, that, that's really what it felt like. Um, like even with how the lockdowns were working and like the PCR testing and like COVID and it was, and like, you know, um, get, you know, it felt like there was a, a real coordinated effort and there was a Time Magazine article about how they fortified the election and all that stuff to actually just get Trump out of office. And I'm not saying I like him or I hate him or whatever it is, right? But it, it, that's just what it felt like. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other conversation for a different episode, man. That is. But yeah. Anyway, man, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about the shirt. Um, so how about this? Let, let's close out. Tell us about who Mumi is, why you're wearing this shirt, what people can do to help, and also talk about how we can get a hold of you. Um, Mumi Al-Jabbar is a political prisoner that – me trying to put it into a, uh, a minute description, I what I would suggest is Google Mumia Al-Jabbar, Google Leonard Peltier, learn about p political prisoners that are sitting in jail for fucking insane reasons that they had nothing to do with, but because they were political activists. Uh, Mumia was Black Panther, Leonard Peltier was in the American Indian Movement, and they trumped up all these bullshit charges, and these men have been sitting in prison as scapegoats for... A long long time and the more educated we can be to 
stop these things from happening, but also be advocates for the release are really, really important. And as for where you can find me, uh, Instagram is a good one, literally Robert Dean. And on Facebook, just look up Robert Dean and you'll see me. I'm covered in tattoos, always posting something about politics or food. Okay, cool. You got and what about articles that you publish or books or like how can we find all that stuff? And um, if you got a YouTube channel, just share yeah, it with me. There's a, you can find it on YouTube, but ultimately just go to those places cuz if I'm promoting something, I share all the articles. I share I just wrote something about the White Sox yesterday, so it's all there and anything that I do, I'll put it on social media so you don't have to t- you don't have to search real hard. Okay. Hey, well Robert, thank you so much for coming on. I'm sorry that this had to get cut short. Uh, I'd love to have you back. We could also talk about like um, leftism and what what um i guess what what i feel is the problem with how leftism is being carried out especially this past year in the pandemic it would be a really fun discussion to have yeah I'll, anytime, um, man. but yeah robert dean ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for coming i really appreciate this thanks man appreciate right. it